Welcome to Wellness Spring. I am your host, Beverly Holt, health and well-being expert with more than four decades of experience in all aspects of wellness. Today, my esteemed guest is Dr. Andy Zama, a triple qualified consultant psychiatrist, founder of the London Psychiatry Centre, and recipient of the Gaskell Gold Medal and Prize from the Royal College of Psychiatrists. Born in Egypt to a diverse cultural background, Dr. Zama is a world-renowned expert in treating affective disorders, pioneering precision medicine and mitochondrial treatment. With the wealth of experience, he has held NHS consultant posts, contributed to NICE guidelines, and introduce innovative technologies to the UK. A multilingual expert, Dr. Zammer is committed to advancing mental health globally. Welcome, Andy, to Wellness Spring. I am so grateful to our communal friend, Ilona Munslow, for introducing us. Thank you very much. I'm very grateful for you having me. It's an absolute pleasure. So, could you please share your journey from my diverse cultural background in Egypt to becoming a triple qualified consultant psychiatrist? Okay, I, um, I'm Greek Lebanese, uh, born in Egypt and uh, um, triple national. Um, and I uh, grew up uh, in a multilingual home um, where we spoke Greek, French, uh, Egyptian classical Arabic came in, uh, English came in, Italian was there. So we we were very exposed. We also were exposed to uh, a massive background of religious uh, upbringing, whereby we studied the New Testament, the Old Testament, and the Quran at school. Um, wow. So we were... Um, fortunate enough to be exposed to just about everything. Um, and I did my scholar education in French and classical Arabic and uh, my medical degree in English. That was in Cairo. And then restless as one is, one wanted to open more horizons. So I took requalification primary medical degree from the UK and the US. And I settled in the UK instead of the US. Um, and uh, then I specialized in psychiatry and uh, I um, thought, you know, restless as one is, that it's time to go beyond what is there. Because what is there, I'm afraid I don't see it as good enough for patients. Were either of you parents psychiatrists or no, in the medical no. field? No. I was an aberration. I can't come from a family of lawyers that I went into medicine and it was an accident that I went into psychiatry. Both of them were accidents. So there's lots of countries, you know, lots of experiences and natural disasters that would lead people into post-traumatic stress as well. Can I uh, shock you a bit? And okay. if you allow me to share my screen on one study, uh, okay. that changed the way I work completely. I was also going to say to you because I was born in Wales. Yeah. And Wales of of the last two decades have had the highest suicide rate in the whole of Europe. And now the journalists don't even advertise it. And it's on all backgrounds. Um there are many so they... factors to that. And I think the the also the adequacy of mental health services is extremely poor. May I share mm. something? Sure. Symptoms of yes. post traumatic disorder. So oh, that was a fascinating study, actually. No, that's... So that was done in 2005. They looked at 3,000 adults, give or take. Do you see where I put the cursor? Yeah. They yeah. sent them questionnaires for PTSD. Yeah. And they looked at the scores. And then they had. About 1,500 responded, which is what you expect, but 832 had PTSD, which is huge for symptoms. Wow. But then they did something which I found was amazing. Here, I'm 
make it bigger. They looked at the type of the trauma and the score. Wow. And the highest two are these two here, this one, 11.3, which is physical or sexual abuse of a child or sexual abuse of an adult. Okay? Yeah. And the second one is physical abuse of an adult at 7.7. .7. And the third wow. was robbery. Yeah. And relationship problems. Affairs, divorce, conflict at home. And the fourth, the fifth was problems with study work. Having problems at work. Or wow. Work. Look where war is. Ah, oh, my God, I can't believe that. Look where disaster is. Wow. So, so small. I'm also surprised, you know, because um, the... Domestic violence is huge globally and lots of women are being murdered. Lots of them are not being reported either. And um, that's quite low as well. Murder or suicide of a loved one, 3.8. Yeah. Do you see what I'm saying? Yeah. That completely so... changed the way I practice. Because... Right. Civilian settings is where your refuge is. Your family is your refuge. Your work is your refuge. At war, you thank your lucky stars you survived. But mm. in this one, you don't expect that to happen. But it happens. And when it happens, it is more devastating than being exposed to a volcano. So when I see people, I ask them about their relationships. I ask them about problems at work, problems at home. And if there are any, I measure using scales whether there is PTSD or not, and I treat. And it is important to treat that because the simplest is strokes increased by 700%, uh, fatal infections increased by 200%, heart attacks, cardiac arrest increases by 300% with PTSD. Wow. So you, it's a physical condition which kills yeah, not the mental. Yeah, yeah. It, it yeah. kills for the physical condition. But that kind of, that study, when I saw it in 2005, it completely changed the way I think. Wow. I'm not surprised, and thank goodness it did, to have um, people like you that are going to be changing our world for the better. So, thank you. Um, pleasure. In your extensive career... Um, what have been some of the memorable cases or success stories, because I know you can't give clients name, in treating resistance and difficult to treat cases? Um, I, I see difficult cases by definition. So I see very, very difficult cases by definition. I see end of the line cases. Sometimes I get right. to the hospital saying nothing can be done. But the most memorable one I'll never forget is a patient who presented with seizure-like activity whenever she was stressed. And she was having psychotherapy and sedatives and God knows what. But I thought, let's study it. So I had her wired to an electroencephalogram and um, something that monitors the uh, diaphragm and the heart rate and the blood pressure and all these things and what we noted is that the blood pressure would go through the roof and with it the diaphragm would contract at one contraction per second one hertz per second at the beginning they were thinking it is a what they call a conversion disorder whereby you're upset you your body responds funnily and you need psychotherapy and uh, what we found is that there's no way your body can do one contraction a second of the diaphragm continuously for 10 minutes, five minutes. And her body would tilt to one side and she would go red, blood pressure would be through the roof. So it turns out to be 
hypertension, high blood pressure, which had damaged parts of the brain. And whenever the blood pressure would go through the roof, these problems would appear. So her treatment was very simple. It was a drug called amlodipine, 10 milligrams. I can't remember how many milligrams, but it was amlodipine. That was in the 90s I saw this case. So what I'm trying to say is that if things don't make sense, don't call them psychiatric. Try and study them. Because um, whilst the brain has a massive impact, in this particular case, the impact was physical. And this person from a totally disabled person just traveled the world on a motorbike, retired, was completely well for years, just with the high blood pressure pill. It's not my field, but yeah, and I solved it. <laughs> so, um, but... Um, so that's a case I'll never forget, because again, as far as I'm concerned, you consider yourself to be always wrong until your patient recovers. So everything you do is wrong until right. the patient recovers. And you're constantly questioning yourself and questioning what you do, you question the medication. For example, with antidepressants mm -hmm. have a recovery rate of 2.7% at one year, and they increase death rate by 33%. So you question that, it, you just don't accept it as the norm. Um, and I guess that answers the question. It's something memorable which changed the way I think. Yeah, I, I totally understand because I've had a few friends who've experienced physical imbalances with their bloods or different things that made them appear that they're suffering from a mental disorder. And thankfully then they had the right um, switched on care to find out that it was a physical and not um, a mental imbalance so they could be treated appropriately. And we so, cannot work without our colleagues. So my view is, yeah. you'll see on my on our website, we work with physicians uh, yeah. all times because they're so interlinked. We cannot say, I'm a psychiatrist, I'll see the patient myself. No, we yeah. have to invite other people to see our patients too, for many reasons, which I highlight on the website. Yeah, and I um, that's what I love about your work, because you work holistically. And I also notice on your website that you've got some dietitians on board as well, nutritionalists. Yeah. And I was keen to know your thoughts on holistic therapies because you um, mentioned breath work at some stage and mindfulness meditations and what other things, because at one stage I was working at Sydney Private Clinic in um, Australia and I was invited to do an ex not an experiment. We did a trial with some of the psychiatrists with aromatherapy oils using the happy oils to try and lift their moods using lavender wheat pillows and different things like that. And for years I've taught meditation to help the clients relax and also um, breath work to teach them instead of panicking, you know, hyperventilating to calm down. So I was wondering whether you include any holistic therapies in your practice. Let me explain. Anything that would reduce arousal counts as a positive treatment. Right. Arousal is our biggest enemy. So what happens is we're exposed to stress, we become more aroused. We become more aroused, we start to malfunction more. We have to use anything and everything to reduce arousal, from exercise to aromatherapy to yoga to uh, sedation. We just have to use anything to reduce arousal. I mean, I was stunned um, and talking about aromatherapy. We had a boy with autism when I was a trainee years ago and they gave him an um, antipsychotic called risperidone. And the poor boy developed what we call neuroleptic malignant syndrome. It's a physical, it's a medical condition which has a death rate of up to 40%, whereby the way the nervous system regulates the bodily function fails. Uh, and um, 
we stop the treatment, it gets better. You start with a tiny dose, he gets it again. And I remember uh, my trainer, was a, he passed away now, Derek Steinberg, his name is, very wise man. He said, let's just reduce arousal. And he got aromatherapy in. And the boy calmed down, as you say. And we reintroduced mm. the drug. He was fine. So, and I read later on that neuroleptic malignant syndrome occurs in highly aroused people. Wow. So even physical disease, the more aroused you are, the worse off you are. So I welcome any intervention that would reduce arousal. And when I tell people to exercise, I tell them aerobic sustain, not high intensity training when they're psychiatrically unwell. Because high intensity mm. training arouses them more. The gym arouses them more. So I want them to go for a long walk in a park, yeah. quiet place. So we need to reduce our in any possible way. So I welcome that as an intervention. Yeah, that's wonderful to hear because just being in nature is so healing and everything that you mentioned. And um, I've been teaching people to nasal breathe and keep their mouth shut because um, when you nasal breathe, you're working on your parasympathetic nerves and that calms everything down. And if you're mouth breathing all day, as you probably know, it stimulates your autonomic nervous system and it's like having prolonged fight and flight. So, you know, you're already hyped up and then you won't sleep and so forth. Um, because you've got a busy scent and you do so many things, what advice would you give to a new psychiatrist starting out or someone who's thinking of studying psychiatry? I would tell them always question what you see. It's not perfection. The methods of diagnosis are still behind. It's the only branch of medicine where you have no tests. You rely on opinions. Uh, number one, you, you have tests, but nobody uses them. You have questionnaires, but nobody uses them. So always question what you see, what you learn. Always read beyond what they tell you to read. And do not trust the word effective, efficacious, safe, because, and respond to treatment. You need to get your patient well with no symptoms at all. You don't say they responded to treatment, you send them home sick still. So you always question the treatments, the diagnosis, and you're always wrong until your patient recovers. That's what I would advise. That's wonderful advice. And because we're living in a multicultural world, and I know you're multilingual, can you share your insights into your multilingual practice and how language diversity impacts patient care and consultation? Um, religion and language, both of them, not one. Um, so I, I, I can do consultations in Italian or French or English or classical Arabic or Egyptian or, you know, it makes people more comfortable. They talk more freely. There are words which you can never translate. But I remember a case of a um, refugee uh, from Somalia, Muslim, and they were deemed to be psychotic and they were given antipsychotic injections. And the story goes, I went to their house. Now Swahili has similarities to Arabic, but not we can understand some words, not all of it. So we're going through interpreters. But the way I thought I would open the dialogue is I walked in the house and I asked if they have a copy of the Quran. They got it. They put it in front of me. And I say, does the patient read the Quran? They said, no. I said, does the patient pray? They said, no. And I asked her to tell me the story of what happened and what turns out to be these hallucinations that we're talking about. Uh, in Somalia in 91, 90, 1991, the state disintegrated and the whole place became very violent and militias were here and there everywhere. But they broke into her house, they killed her husband, they attacked oh. her. 
and then they left. And those hallucinations were not psychotic. She was rehearing what happened and witnessing it in her eyes. And that's PTSD, to which mm. antipsychotics by injection will do nothing. Wow. So to rethink the whole treatment. And it was the trust I gained was via the Quran. I'm Christian, I'm not Muslim, but yeah, it makes sense but... to make the patient feel at ease with cultural or lingual ability. Yeah. Well, that's a um, very good tip because... Um... You know, Brian and I have lived in many countries and, you know, a very good Scottish friend of mine who's actually 104, who has also lived in many countries, he said, you can't live in a country until you get to know their culture and you can't expect to change people, you know, and you have to know their culture so you can speak on the same wavelengths yeah. and understand them. Yeah. And just before we close, I always ask my guests, if there was one thing you could do to change the world, what would it be? So many things you want to do. I think I can talk about what I can do rather than what I wish I could do. Okay. So what I can do is leave them a test to reduce the burden of disease for many years to come. That's what I would do. Whether it will change the world, I don't know, but it will reduce the suffering. Exactly. And I don't know how I'll do it. Well, I think change starts with us and it's one step at a time. So you're already making plans to do the test. So, you know, there's hope for our future. So I just want to thank you for all you are and all you do. And thank you for giving up your precious time. And where's the best way for people to contact you? Do they have to have a doctor's referral or can they no. contact you directly? They can contact us directly. They can call the center or write to info at psychiatrycenter.co.uk. There's an email. So they can contact us through there. That's wonderful. And I'll put it all with the show notes. So thank you very much for your words of wisdom. Thank you very much, Beverly. It's been a pleasure meeting you.